Let love be without hypocrisy. Hate what is evil. Cleave to what is good. Be devoted to one another with brotherly love. Prefer one another in honor. <clears throat> Do not be lazy in diligence. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. And practice hospitality. <clears throat> Father, please, anoint the preaching of your word. Help us to understand what it is you're saying to us today. <clears throat> Quicken our spirits, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> that frog could pull his feet in a little bit. <clears throat> this, how many of you have ever created a laundry list? A laundry list. You know, you get aggravated with somebody, and then you create a laundry list of things you want them to do. This, when I read this this week, I said, I set myself up. It sounds to me like God has a laundry list with his church, doesn't it? I said, woe is me. I could preach, I could preach this sermon series for weeks. I could preach one verse for probably three weeks. We'd be in Romans 12 for a long time. But I think God gave me some insight. Did you catch what was happening up here? What does the first verse say, verse 9? Love, let love be without hypocrisy. Some translations say sincerely. I would say really love. But what is hypocrisy? Hypocrisy is saying one thing and doing another, right? Or it's saying, I don't think you should do this, and then you do it. Or it's saying, I think you should do such and such, but then you don't do it. That's what hypocrisy is. And people just kill me all the time. They say... You know, I, I walk around pretty well for a dead person, don't I? They kill me all the time. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I can't help it. It's just Munson Road humor coming out my pores. They say, the church is full of hypocrites. And I say, oh, my goodness. Look in the mirror. You'll see the, near, the hypocrite that's nearest to you, right? I need to watch these things as I speak because a couple of years ago I said, you're the biggest villain in your own story. If you want to see the biggest villain in your story, look in the mirror. And it's come back to bite me. Every time I say, you're the villain in my story in my house, my family says, no, look in the mirror. <laughs> At least I know they heard it. And they won't let me forget that they heard it. So hypocrites are everywhere, aren't they? The difference between church hypocrites and other hypocrites is that in the church, we're not perfect. We are trying to change. Whereas people out in the world, whether they're believers or not, aren't trying to change the same way. Because in order to change, it takes other people. It takes other people. So what is this? There are a lot of times that people in the church say, I love you. They don't actually say it like that. They say, I love you, brother. Or I don't know how women say it. How do women say it, Kay? I love you. Okay, there's the woman's version. Thank you very much. I didn't dare pretend to carry that one off. Um, but, but so many times we don't show love. People say they love one another, but then they don't. Now, let's explain what this idea of love is. This in, first, in Romans 12, verse 9, says, Let love be without hypocrisy. That word for love is the one that we talk about so much of the time, agape love. And if you want to know what agape love is, it's a choice. It's an act of the will. It's not a feeling. We choose to show people certain kindnesses. And we choose to show it to them repeatedly. It is not Christian. Go ahead and stand up. He's an Eagles fan. I've made peace with Eagles fans. Did you notice that after I ran the Giants down last week, they won? It took them long enough. You know, I think we should start bad-mouthing them every single week. Especially when they're going to play the Eagles. You do, yeah, I believe you do. She's a Bills fan. No hope for her. <laughs> so, you know, this is what a lot of times it looks like. You know, man, I love you. But then I go and I say, hey, guys, I'm an Eagles fan. He'll never amount to anything. I'm sorry, you know, you just have to. You know, we talk badly about people. And when we're face to face, we make it sound like we're loving. But then how do we show it? 
Thank you, brother. And I do, you know, you're precious. And actually, I'm starting to like the Eagles. I like their quarterback, so. But I'll never convert. <laughs> Agape love, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 8 says love. And I love the NIV. It says love hopes all things, believes all things, trusts all things, endures all things. Love never fails. That's a choice. So, for, so Romans 12, 9 is saying, let love, this choice, be without hypocrisy. Let it be sincere. What does it look like? This is what it doesn't look like. Saying that we love someone, and then we won't spend time with them. Saying that we love someone, but we're not going to work with them. We're not going to help them. We're not going to serve. What does love look like? God, you know, it's, the point is really clear. God, God tells us, you and I, that we, we must love one another. Remember the first three sermons of the series so far. First week was present your bodies as living sacrifices, which means total surrender of all we are, all we do, all we think. We don't become robots, but we surrender our lives to him. The next week was don't be conformed any longer to the world, but be renewed, be transformed through the renewing of our mind. So we become more like Jesus. And last week was serve the body, serve the body. But the theme for the whole series, do you remember what the theme for the whole series is? We need one another. Would you say it with me? We need one another. We need one another. Oh, come on. Are you going to leave me out there hanging and cut the limb off? Come on. We need one another. We need, oh, come on. We need one another. Pre pretend it's a political chant, okay? We need one another. We need one another. We need one another, because if we believe we need one another, we're more willing to serve in one of those seven gifts or some combination of those gifts we talked about last week. We really do need one another. If we understand that we need one another, and not only do we need one another, but we understand that we are members of one another. We're individuals. Oops, I just tipped something over that had a lot of weight. I can just get into trouble no matter where I go. We are connected. We are connected to other believers. We don't have a choice. And so there's a sense of ownership. There's a sense of responsibility that is mentioned in Romans 12 that we cannot escape. And hence, we need one another. We need to serve one another. But now God tells, tells us, really, really love one another. Could you say it? Really, I need to. I need really. really. I'm going to look at your neighbor. Say, you. you. I really need to love you. Now look to the other neighbor. I really need to love you. Sermon's all done. We can go home. We can have barbecue. That's the main point. But let's talk about how to do it. How to love. When you look at these verses, there are so many things to do. Literally, I could preach this, this, these series of verses for weeks. But I boiled it down to four attitudes. I believe you can summarize the majority of these verses in four attitudes. Something you and I choose to do, and if we choose to have that attitude, we will be displaying Christian love. And the way you can remember this is H, D, P, C. Now say it quicker. H, D. What's that sound like? High definition, right? P, C. Don't think political correctness. PC is something good in this case. Pure Christianity. HDPC. High definition, pure Christianity. You want to see, see what Christian love really should be? High definition, pure Christianity. Four attitudes. The first attitude we find in verse 10 and verse 10, actually. Let us read it. Reread it. Actually, it's in verse 9 helps if you're still in Romans 12. Verse 9 says, let love would be without hypocrisy. Then it says, hate what is evil, cleave to what is good. Hate what is evil, cleave to what is good. The attitude I'm suggesting is holiness. Holiness is an attitude. We have to say, I will be holy. It's an attitude. We have to have that attitude, I will be holy. Holiness is hating what is evil, detesting what is evil, and clinging to what is good or cleaving to what is good in that. Cleaving or clinging, it literally means to glue. Anybody like really good super glue? 
Any of you like gluing things together? Hey, how many of you know about Gorilla Glue? Oh, I like Gorilla Glue. Whoa. It, you know, you stick stuff together with that, and it's glued. I like Gorilla Tape, too. You say Gorilla, and I'm there. But I'm not a Gorilla. Gorilla, you know, that glue, but there's something that they took off the market. Back in the 70s, my cousin was building ro rom radio control planes from scratch. You know, little balls of parts, and it took him a long time, and then he'd drive them into the ground, and he had to start from scratch. He, there was a glue called Hot Stuff, and it was better than any super glue I've seen today. If, if I had my fingers there and I just put a drop right there, it was instantly fastened. That stuff was good. If you ever find something like that, let me know. That was good. But my closest, you know, Gorilla Glue is not that fast, but it works. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good is an attitude of holiness. Why is it so very important? Because when I come through those doors on a Sunday morning or any day of the week or I have contact with you any day of the week, if I don't hate what is evil and I don't cleave to what is good, let's use my past. If I look at pornography, if I start listening to uh, a lot of bad language, country music's bad for me because there's a lot of bad language. What's bad? Well, you know what bad language is. You wouldn't want me using it from the pulpit. In fact, when I use pseudonyms or not pseudonyms, but when I use things that sound the same, I get, I hear about it. You've grown patient with me. I try not to because it's hard for me to overcome. I have to have the attitude, I will be holy. So I don't listen to movies that have that language. I don't listen to songs that have that language because otherwise I use that language. But there are other things that come with that. If I start looking at pornography, I start listening to that kind of language, my attitude becomes more fleshly, less holy, less, less like Christ, more like my selfish self. So when I come in, I am more prone to getting down and discouraged. And as I have contact with you, you're going to notice that you don't feel uplifted, but rather you're starting to protect yourself when I have contact with you because I hurt you. Because I'm becoming more selfish. The more I hate what's evil, the more I safeguard myself, and the less I poison you folks. But that's true for every single one of us. So God says, because... Roger, your attitudes are going to affect everybody else. And if you come in and your attitude is, I will be holy, and you, you know, it's a wrestling match for us, but if our goal is to be holy, same with Gunner, same with you, Brooke, if we choose to detest what's evil, and it's true for every single one of us, the more we detest what's evil, we reject it, we cleave to what's good, and what is good? Philippians 4 says, think on those things that are good and true and noble and trustworthy. Friends, when I came to the end of my rope in the summer of 83, I did not know if God were real. I had always believed he was real, but I knew the devil was real. I knew he was real. And so in those dark days where I didn't want to live, I figured, what's the point of living if at any second you can drop dead? What's the point of living if at any second you can drop dead? My attitude, I was just down in the dumps. But I knew this. I knew the devil was real. It's like, I'm not going to give him the satisfaction. But you know what? I was probably not the easiest person to be around because even though I knew he was real, I was still embracing a lot of things that God says are wrong. And I felt terrible. Only my buddy Bob Fender wanted to be around me. He wanted me to go out fishing. It's an attitude you and I bring into the church. Does that make sense? So H, holiness. How does that affect the body? Well, if I'm going to love you, I'm not going to harm you by being involved in sinful behaviors and thoughts. If I love you, I'm going to cling to that which is good so I am better. Otherwise, I bring infection into the body. Does that make sense? That's how I show, that's a way of showing love by saying, okay, Lord, I can, because, you know, if a lot of people come in, and we, there will be people coming in who don't know the Lord, but Father, we're talking, or Father, we're talking about the body. We're talking about you and me who know Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, today is the day of salvation. It's the day to say, Jesus, be my Lord. If you've never said, Jesus, please be my Lord, you're not a Christian. 
You're not going to heaven. You need to say, Jesus, please be my Lord. Surrender your life to him. Say, I turn my life over to you. And in that moment, you become born again. Rome, John chapter 3. And you're forgiven. So this, this message is aimed at Christians. Because unbelievers, we can't expect there, and they need to come in. But as we are the body of Christ who know him, and we detest what is evil, that doesn't mean in other people, that means in ourselves. Detest what is evil and cling to what is good. The body becomes stronger. If each one of us takes responsibility for ourselves, oh, we get so much. The air becomes sweeter. H, D, devotion is an attitude. I will be devoted. Verses 10 and 11. Be devoted to one another with brotherly love. Prefer one another in honor. Do not be lazy in diligence. I love that. Don't be lazy. Oh, I love that. There are coordinators right now who are saying, preach, don't be lazy, Sam. I'm getting there. Just be patient. Just be patient. Don't be lazy. Do not be lazy in diligence. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. So that's a lot of content, isn't it? I will be devoted. Let's talk about what Paul's getting at here. The word devoted itself means a family affection. It means an affection like a parent to a child. A tenderness. We love, and so be devoted means love one another, be care for one another like you do for your physical family. Now, some of us maybe didn't feel that kind of affection in our families. Maybe we don't. But we know what we would like to have. Others of us know what it feels like, don't we? Unconditional acceptance. Tenderness. Even when you make a mistake. But then Paul goes further. He says, with brotherly affection, brotherly love. We've got two different types of love operating. In verse 9, let us love one another is agape love. That's an act of the will. That's a choice. In verse 10, this brotherly affection, this brotherly love is the Greek word Philadelphia. And it means brotherly affection. It's, it's, it is a feeling. We, we have that affection. And so... Paul is saying, be devoted to one another. We, we choose to be devoted and care for one another with tenderness and with real affection. How do we do that? Do you see how if we, can, if we can obey just that much command, do you see how it's easier to love with agape love? It's easier to do show kindness to people and trust them and hope even when they're going through challenges if we genuinely feel for them? How do we get there? Two ways. The first... He says, prefer one another in honor. Prefer one another in honor. When I work through the, the languages and the words and what they mean, and I look through the New Living Translation and the Amplified Bible, this is, this is what he's really saying. I will show you how highly I value you by placing you before myself. Paul is saying each of us needs to have this attitude where we, we are thinking and we are going to show others how highly we value them by placing them ahead of ourselves. Too many times we show people how little we value them by not putting them ahead of ourselves. With the examples that you saw in the two skits. But it's not so hard to show people how much we value them, how highly we value them, by putting them ahead of ourselves. An example would be when we have the fellowship meal. Any fellowship meal, you go in and you have a group of friends you feel comfortable with, and they're sitting there, and you see one person sitting by himself or herself at a table all by himself. Who do you sit with? If you want to obey this command and really let love reign in the church, you leave your, you don't even go sit with your friends. You go sit with this person who's by himself or herself. You want to maybe be with your friends. So you're denying yourself, picking up your cross, following Jesus. But you're preferring the other person and you're saying, I value you so highly. And you don't say it. You go sit with them. You don't make them self-conscious. But you're telling them, I value you very highly. 
We, we got to do this on a Wednesday night. You know, if, if somebody comes into the class on a Wednesday night, usually Penny and I sit side by side. Oh, I like that. Physical touch is my language. I'll sit right beside her, tight as I can. Because we're married, I want her to know that I'm with her, and she's never alone. Well, the only one who can really keep that promise is the Holy Spirit, right? But as much as it is humanly possible. So I sit with her. She sits with me. But if we have a guest, I may sit with a guest to show the, the value I place in the guest. That's important. And so there are times when that's, that's one way that we show people. That's how we build that brotherly affection. It, it helps us love others when we do it, and it helps them feel loved and love others because they receive it. The second one, when you read this, don't be lazy in diligence. I love that. Go ahead and say it with me. Don't be lazy in diligence. Let's say it one more time. Don't be lazy in diligence. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Do you want to know what? If we boil that all the way down, serve others with a good attitude. You know, enthusiasm. Right now, I'm just feeling good. I feel like there's macaroni and cheese for lunch. There's not. But I feel like I feel like the New York Giants are going to win the Super Bowl. That's not going to happen this year. I'm feeling good today. Do you know what I mean? There are times when people come into the room and we can feel energetic. And energy feeds off. You know, and it's like, Bonnie, if you come in and dance, I'm going to be flabbergasted. <laughs> right? But she can have enthusiasm without dancing. Right? It's, it's a good spirit. It's a good attitude. Who would you rather have come into the room? Somebody who, you know, and we're talking believers. We're not talking unbelievers. You know, if I come in, I'm like a black hole. Do you want to sit near me? No. Or some of us are monotone, flatline. Are we even alive? Right? Fervency in spirit, a good attitude. You know, I'm so glad to be here. I am honored to be able to be here and serve as your pastor. I'm honored to be able to speak this morning. I'm honored to be able to come and see you when you're in the hospital or sick. I'm honored when you come to want to talk about something in my office. It is a privilege. It is fun. It is wonderful to serve the Lord. Yeah. And it is wonderful to see you guys when, you, when you're getting along. It's like, praise the Lord. And it's not because there's not trouble, but it's like, it feels good. But serving one another Sometimes when we're serving in the church, we think, where is everybody else? Right? And when you feel as though there's nobody else really doing anything, you get tired, you get discouraged, and you don't want to do anything. You say, well, what's the point of going to church? It's just work, 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 and nobody else cares, so what's the point of it? And yet, if we all serve, and we seek to serve one another with joy, with a good attitude, a good attitude, it builds everybody up. And so suddenly you've got somebody working beside you. It's like, you know what? I'm not a painter, but I'll help you paint. Maybe Jim needs help with his roof. And three of us go over. I, you know, it's cool. HD, holiness and devotion. I will be devoted to you. I will be devoted to you. That's a choice. I want to prefer you and show you how much I value you by preferring you over myself. And I'm going to serve you with a good attitude because it makes all our lives easier. There are people in the church who serve. I forgot to embarrass Jean Scott. You can tell her she got off lucky. But I'm going to embarrass Donna. She's devoted to the church. She's, what's the church? She's not devoted to the building. She's not devoted to the pastor. She's devoted to the people here. She's devoted to us. I'm in one of those, and so I get to benefit because she's devoted to us. We're the church. So when she gets a call for somebody who needs food, she comes. When she knows there's a need, she shows up. If there's somebody who needs a word of encouragement, she does it. Jean Scott's the same way. She's been doing it for decades. You know, Jean Scott, when she could drive, would go and she'd do visitation. She'd take people. She'd cook meals. She'll still, she bake cookies for me for a neighbor here at the church. But now I can call her any time of day or night and say, Jean, would you pray? She's devoted. She, she prefers other people. 
She puts our needs ahead of her own sometimes. Rather than sleep, she prays. And she'll call other prayer warriors. Folks, that's, that builds us up. Doesn't it, doesn't it make you feel good to know there are people like that? Be people like that. Right? It's, a, it's, a, it's an attitude. It's a way we show one another we love one another. Nursery needs workers. I don't know the needs right now, but nursery always needs workers. Give your workers paper. Say, yeah, I'll prefer other people. I'll prefer other people. I'll serve. Thank you, Lord. When you do that, you encourage Kay, not only Kay, but so many other people in the church because the other laborers say, wow, I'm not in this alone. Being lonely gets tiring, doesn't it? Feeling like your own kind of runs you down just a little. What's the third? So HD, high definition, holiness and devotion. P, perseverance. Go to verse 12. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. Rejoice in hope, endure or be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. If we're going to rejoice in hope, especially when things aren't going so easily, isn't that an attitude? If things have been going wrong in your life or there are challenges, to rejoice in hope, to rejoice. Oh, what do we rejoice in? What do we just rejoice with? You know, today I'm alive. You know, there are people in here who are going through some really difficult things this season. We all can rejoice in hope. We can all endure in patience. We can all persevere in prayer. How do we do it? What's our hope? That tomorrow's a new day? Well, that's kind of, you know, it's true. God's mercies are new every day. But if that's our hope, it's not going to last too long. That that meal, when I get home, is going to be wonderful. And then you get home and you left. You either didn't turn on the crock pot or it's overcooked. There goes your hope. Right? Our hope is in Jesus. Our hope is in Jesus. Hebrews 12, 2. Fix your eyes on the author and perfecter of your faith. Our hope is in Jesus. What about Jesus? Man, no matter what else happens, no matter how much I'm suffering, no matter what I'm going through, no matter what I'm facing, it doesn't matter it doesn't change, it does matter, but it doesn't change my hope. I don't rejoice because of what I'm suffering. I don't rejoice because of what I'm experiencing. I rejoice in Him. He died for me. He was raised from the dead, and that means there's life after death. He said that if I will confess Him as Lord, I have eternal life. I have hope in Him because He says there's life after death. I get a new body. Hallelujah. I don't have to worry about liver. I don't have to worry about knees. I don't have to worry about back. I don't know what happens with hair. I get new body. I get forever with him, and he's wonderful. Even if I don't understand what the future holds and I don't understand what it all is going to look like, I know that he loves me, and I've had evidence in my life. Amen. He is my hope no matter what I face or go through. Amen. So I can rejoice in him. And as we rejoice in him, no matter what we're going through, you become a bright spot. You become a bright spot, and others say, wow, you're fun to be around. And the more people who are fun to be around, you know what? Pretty soon there's a bright spot who encourages you. Endure suffering. We endure suffering because we know it's temporary. God might not heal you. God might heal you. But God might not heal you. Our hope is not in the healing. Our hope is in Him. And so we endure the suffering for a time because we know that this life is short. But our hope is in Him. And so... The person who endures suffering with patience, it's like they're, they're leaning on Christ. They continue, it says, person in prayer. Can you imagine the person who rejoices in hope while they're enduring suffering? They can pray. Even in a hospital bed, you can pray. I'll tell people, I'll go to the hospital, and people are, you know, they're struggling. It's like, get you, and I don't say this, but one thing you can do is to get your mind off yourself, pray for another person's needs. Right? And you know what? You're living with yourself. There are some other people who are praying for you. Don't be afraid to pray for others. One of the best examples I can think of, and I've said this repeatedly, but some of you knew Debbie Dan. Some of you never met Debbie Dan, but everyone needs to know the Debbie Dan. I've seen other people go through it, but she had breast cancer when we started attending the church in 99. She died a few years later. But what I saw in her 
was she rejoiced in the Lord. She was patient in suffering. She endured suffering, and she was a prayer warrior. She, she would pray, and she encouraged me. She encouraged so many people. She's an example of what can happen as we fix our eyes on the Lord and draw closer to And I've seen that with more than just Debbie, where people who are in their last days or months or years, they're drawing closer to the Lord, and even though they are, do go through suffering, there's a sweetness because they're drawn so close. They love him. And they, they encourage us. P, perseverance. And C, he says, contribute to the needs of others. And what does he close with? Practice hospitality. Contribute to the needs of the saints and practice, practice hospitality. And I would join those together and say caring. Caring. We know what it means to help with the needs of others. Sometimes, you know, if the girls have some need, I can go over and I can help them fix the sink. Be careful because I'm not a plumber. <laughs> but I might be able to help them with the sink. Maybe I can help. But maybe there's a bigger project and a group of us go over so I can tr I'm one of many people contributing to help. So we need to watch for those needs and that's another way of serving. But hospitality, hospitality, the Life Application Study Bible I like it, and in, in the hospitality really means opening your door to strangers. Hospitality is not social entertaining. When someone is socially entertaining, the host, the, the host is focusing on himself or herself. Well, I've got to have the house clean. I want the per food to be perfect. I've got to be in a good demeanor even though I just you know, I kicked the dog and the dog bit me back and I burned half the roast and I had to go to the grocery store and get a new one. I have to be in just, I have to be cheerful. Everything focuses on the host for social entertaining. But Christian hospitality focuses on the needs of the guests. Acceptance. Nourishing food, a place to stay. A listening ear. Christian hospitality focuses on the needs of the guests. It doesn't mean that the house is clean. It means that you pay attention. And folks, the best example I can think of this, and I don't have names, but there have been people that I've gone to visit to encourage. And I'll go and I visit, and I walk out more encouraged than I think. I, I, it's like, what happened here? I went to encourage them, and I feel better when I leave than when I went. How did that happen? Because you go in and you try to minister to somebody, and it's not like they're rejecting it. They're just tuned in to you. So, yeah, they'll give me a piece of cheese, like a mouse, or a piece of pie, or maybe not. They ask how you're doing. They, they pray with you. They're focused on you. They want to make sure you're okay. And, you know, Debbie was like that. My Aunt Margaret was like that. That's the gift of hospitality. And so when you leave, it's like, well, even though you went to minister to them, they minister to you. It's like, wow, that's hospitality. But that's, a, that's an attitude. Holiness is an attitude. I choose to be holy. Devotion is an attitude. I choose to be devoted to you. Perseverance is an attitude. I choose to not quit. Most of the time when we speak or we write, we're told, put things in a positive term. Say, I'll keep going. But isn't there a place where it, it's, it's important to say, I won't quit? And it means the same as, I'll keep going. That time when the devil had me over the barrel in 83, I said, I won't do what he wants and commit suicide. I don't know if there is a real God, but I won't quit. That was without the Holy Spirit. Now with the Holy Spirit, it's like, okay, I'm going to persevere through the hard times or the good times because Jesus is with me. So what does, what does this idea of love, agape love, look like? Holiness. It's an attitude of holiness so that I stay pure and the church stays pure. It's devotion. I will put you, I will show you how important you are by putting you ahead of myself, and I will serve with a good attitude. It's persevering. No matter what happens, I will rejoice in the Lord, and I will be patient in suffering and not crying or wailing or gnashing my teeth or biting people when they come to me, which I can do all of. And I'll keep praying. And it's caring. Helping people. Trying to help meet their needs. 
And, you know, some, there is the gift of hospitality, but what Paul is calling us to here is something you and I choose to do. We can do no matter whether it's our gifting or not. Would you stand with me, please? We encourage the body. We strengthen the body. Now I'm going to ask you, take the hands of the people to your right and left. Don't squeeze too hard. If you have a sore finger, tell them. If you choose to have them grab a hold of your ear, that's on you. Please don't grab any noses. It's allergy season. <laughs> to obey what God has said is to, to really love one another. And to be able to pursue any of these attitudes or say, I will have this attitude, we must be born again.